Well, again, I want to thank all of you for showing up and, and coming to participate in this class. Um, it, as Father said, it's been something that, that's interested me for a while now, too, and I found it providential when he asked me if I would be interested in teaching, of course. Um, at the time, it was probably the middle of the spring semester, I was still in seminary, and I was doing um, a, a study of a book, kind of independent, it wasn't a, a formal class, so to speak, but with another professor, we were, we were going through a book on the angels. Um, so I, I kind of saw the Lord's hand in it from the beginning when, when Father asked me to teach this. Just to kind of give you an idea of the layout of the course, you sh those of you who pre-registered should have that um, in your folders. The first lecture here today, we'll talk about the nature of the angels. Then we'll move from there into the angels in creation um, and, and the trial period in the fall. And then we'll go through two sessions of the angels within the economy of salvation history. So the Old Testament and the New Testament. Um, and I don't have the sheet in front of me, but I know we'll do a course on the fallen angels. We'll do one on the guardian angels, the archangels, the nine choirs. Um, we'll have one on the angels and the lives of the saints. Um, and then we'll hopefully conclude with the angels and worship, particularly in the mass. Um, and, you know, that's, that's tentative right now. That's, it's, it's flexible. So if you have questions, and I see that the questions that are coming um, kind of move us slightly off that track without taking us completely in another ballpark, then, then we may digress a little bit from what the, the schedule has. But, but for now, that's, that's the track we're going to kind of proceed down. Today is going to be um, one of the the more difficult um, classes possibly just because we're talking about angelic nature and that's something that's uh, that's above human nature and so it's it's a little bit tougher for us to grasp um, but we do have what the church has given us in her teachings we have the wisdom of the saints um, and then we a lot of what we're going to be using is is not necessarily dogma per se, but it's going to be it's going to be the teaching of many of the saints, in particular Saint Thomas, Saint Thomas Aquinas, who is known as the angelic doctor because of the amount of work that he did on the angels um, and his theological speculation, which is based on a found found philosophical basis, um, and so it's something that's that's although not necessarily the church again proposes is dogma. It's something that, that is something that we can put our trust in and put our faith in. To so begin with, and I'll again want to point out just a few texts that I'm using other than quotes from the saints, the church fathers, um, St. Thomas, Pseudo Dionysius or Dionysius the Areopagite is one of the um, the other main sources for a lot of the work that we have on angels. Um, I'm going to be using some of the quotes that you hear, hear today will be from this book right here. Um, it's called The Angels in Catholic Teaching and Tradition by Father Pascal Parente. I'm going to get you a bibliography. I think next week we'll, we'll hand out packets and in the back of that package you'll have a bibliography with a number of sources that I've used and some that I, I haven't used, but there's, there's plenty out there. So, just a little bit why the Course on Angels. If, if any of y'all read the bulletin article that I put in there last week, I think it was, maybe two weeks ago. It's just the idea that, that there's, there's a, a lot of fascination with the spiritual world, the spiritual realm. realm. Um, but there's also a lot of bad theology or just false teaching out there when it comes to angels. And some of that has to do with, uh, you know, the influence of art, of culture, and, and media, obviously, and how we portray things. Um, and so hopefully this will, will kind of dispel some of, some of those false ideas and false notions of angels and give, her, give us a deeper appreciation. 
of the reality of the angelic world. So to begin with, I'm going to start with a quote from St. Augustine, which the Catechism also uses in its section on the angels. We're speaking about the nature of the angels. The angels are spirits, but it is not because they are spirits that they are angels. They become angels when they are sent. For the name angel refers to their office, not to their nature. You ask the name of this nature, it is spirit. You ask its office, it is that of an angel. So what St. Augustine is, is making an important distinction here between, between office and nature. You know, the, the term angel itself comes from the Greek word angelos, which was a term that means messenger, which is what he says. Um, so even in, in the ancient cultures, when Greek was a predominant language, angelos could be referred to as like the mailman, you know, somebody who's bringing a message. Um, but the reason we call them that, it's, it's not insignificant because it tells us something about what they do. So we see that often throughout the scriptures, the angels are sent from God to deliver some message to his people. Um, and so just an important distinction between what they do, their office, and what they're commonly called, and their nature, which is spiritual. And that's what we get from the Fourth Lateran Council and the First Vatican Council. It said, the nature of the angels is spiritual. I'm not going to read you the quotes, but just know that we draw that from those church councils. So what does it mean to be spiritual? It means that they are incorporeal. They are without bodies. Right? The immaterial. And that, that's going to have, have a, a, a huge impact on how we approach their nature because we do have bodies. Right? And so part of the rest of this, this discussion, what I'm going to try to do is to juxtapose the angelic nature and the human nature. So we're going to go from here to talking about angelic knowledge, how they know, and their will, and then a little bit about how they move and their powers. Um, each angel, right, incorporeal spiritual beings, meaning they don't have bodies, we can't see them, is an individual person. Okay? Created similar to us in the likeness of God, we would say they're closer to God than us in the, in the order of creation. And the reason being is God is pure spirit, right? Angels being pure spirit in their nature are closer to God than we are. And this is without talking about the effects of grace. I don't want to bring any confusion into the picture. If you have questions after, we can, we can try to answer those. But, but just on the, the level of nature, without God's grace influencing either, the angelic nature is higher than human nature, closer to God because of its likeness to Him and that He's pure spirit. Endowed, like us, with an intellect and a will. Okay, so they don't have bodies, materially speaking, but they have an intellect and they have a will. And so nature is distinguished by its faculties and its operations. The faculties being intellect and will, the operations of those faculties. The intellect is made to know, and in particular to know truth. And the will is meant to choose according to the truth, so to choose the good. Okay, now here's, here's where it kind of gets hairy, so I'm going to start making the distinctions between human, human and angelic. So the angels, at the moment of creation, were infused meaning God imparted to them, placing them the essence of every created thing. Okay. 
I'm going to juxtapose that with human nature. We don't have knowledge of every created thing. We experience the created thing. So I can look at this chair, and I see a chair, and I come to, to grasp the concept of what it means to be a chair. Something that has legs, something that has a place for me to sit, and, it's, and it stands upright. Angels, contrary to that, they would have the concept infused into their intellects. And so they would have an understanding of what all chairs would look like before they even encountered one particular chair. So they kind of work the opposite we do. We work from particulars to the abstract concept. And the reason is because of that first thing, the first point we made. We have bodies and they don't. Knowledge for humans is mediated through our senses. What we see, what we taste, what we touch, what we hear. And through our sensual experience of the created world, we're able to abstract com concepts. The angels, because they don't have bodies, they don't, knowledge is not mediated to them, right? They grasp everything immediately and totally. They exhaust what is to be known about something. Now that's it's something that we're going to have to nuance, especially when we're talking about how they know us. Right? Um, so if they were created, and at the moment of creation, God infused them with the knowledge of all other created things. We're just talking about things in their nature, what they are, their essences. It's important to realize that angels do not have knowledge. They cannot read our minds. Right? So they would have knowledge of human nature. They would understand completely what it means to be human. And since they would understand how, how our emotions work, how our senses work, how our bodies work, but they cannot read our minds and our hearts right? because we have freedom. So they don't have an understanding or a foreknowledge of how we're going to use our free will. And also, I would say too, and because you'll hear some of this with, with regard to um, the people's encounters with angels and sometimes with, with um, exorcists and their encounters with the demonic, where it'll appear that the angels know future events. You know, so their, their intellects far superior to ours, what we said, but they can't know the future, is what I just said. And yet experience tells us that sometimes they're able to, to foretell future events. What's going on there and what we have to realize is that their knowledge and their intellect is far superior to ours. So again, they're able to look at something and exhaust everything there is to know about it in the sense of, of its being as a creature. And one of the things that they're able to do is to connect cause and effect. So they can look at something and see how it, how it produces a certain effect. And so they're able to see that much more clearly too. The relationship between cause and effect. So they, they're able to look at a number of different things at a much deeper level than we are, understand the cause and effect relationships between all of those, and anticipate something that's probably going to happen. So it's not that they have certain knowledge of the future, but because because of the power of their intellect, they're able to make certain conjectures about it that are, that are probable because of their understanding of cause and effect relationships. Y'all following me on this? I know we're getting pretty dense here. So this is going to be the most dense one. So, uh, so bear with me.
Um, but it's important that we understand some of these things. And the church, as far as faith goes, tells us that the only thing we need to hold about the angels, this angelic knowledge, other than the fact that we can say that it's superior to us, is that they don't have knowledge of our hearts. Okay, that they can't read our hearts, they can't read our minds. So we understand the distinction too between human understanding, human knowledge, and, and angelic knowledge. How one's mediated through the senses and the other one's not mediated. Something else in regard to that. Human knowledge is something that's built up gradually. And you know, we talk about the age of reason being seven. But even before that, children learning. And then we, we gather more knowledge and build upon the knowledge you know, until the day we die, hopefully. Talking about we're always learning. It's not like that with the angels. They, their knowledge is, is perfect from the moment of their creation. So they don't, they don't necessarily learn something new, so to speak. Um, now, again, that's something that needs to be nuanced because they don't necessarily know how we're going to act with our free will, but they have an understanding of how everything operates, how everything is and works according to its nature. So because of that, and we'll move into the angelic will next. Because of the perfection of their knowledge and the superiority of their intellects. When it comes to willing, you know, a movement of the will towards something, making a decision, they don't make mistakes. It's not like us where we say, oh, you know, this is what it looked like to me. This was what the situation looked like. And so I chose to do this. If I'd have known all these other things about the situation, I would have chose to do something different. It's not like that with the angels. They have a complete understanding of the things as they are. And so because of that, when they choose, it's permanent. They move their will perfectly to something and they're committed. I'd like to share with you a quote from that, from this, from this book that I, I was showing you. It's somewhat poetic, but I like it. That's why I'm going to share it. Following that perfect knowledge of theirs, the angel's surrender to love is immediate, unwavering, utterly whole, and completely irrevocable. The fire of an angel's love is not built up slowly. It has no stages of mere smoldering, no agonizing moments of dying embers. Rather, the angel is immediately a holocaust, a roaring conflagration, a flame with a love that will never lessen. So once the will is moved, it's done. Permanent. Well, we're going to get to that next class. Stay tuned. That's a, <laughs> it's a good question, though. And I mean, it's, it's kind of an obvious question that follows. We'll talk about it. Um, yeah, so that, that's, in a nutshell, what an, the angelic will is. Okay, so it's important to understand angelic intellect and see the impact that that has on the will. So next we'll, we'll move to angelic motion and angelic power. And it'll be more on angelic motion, but the power is, the power is also uh, influential in, in understanding this notion. Because again, if angels are pure spirits, they're immaterial, then how can we talk about them being in a place and moving? Because when we talk about place, I'm in this building, we're talking about something that's set off by boundaries, by physical boundaries. And if there's no physicality to an angelic nature, 
then how do we say that they're in a particular place? St. Thomas would say that angels are said to be in a place insofar as their power is being acted upon that place, right? Um, so insofar as an angel is acting on something, it is said to be in a, in a particular place. But again, place is something that's more proper to the material world. We got a question? Yes, please. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, we, and we'll talk about that um, probably in two classes or so, the idea. So we're talking about, she's, her question was with, that scripture says that some have, have entertained angels um, without knowing it. Um, and so the idea of something being immaterial, the angels don't have bodies, how is it that sometimes in the scriptures we see them with bodies? Um, we'll speak about that again in a couple weeks. Um, but yes, yeah, so the, the angelic power we talked about is significant when we're talking about angels being in a particular place. And it's the same thing, I guess we'd say, when, with angelic motion. When they move, it's not like us, where we have to get up and actually walk to a certain place, or drive, or fly, um, take a boat or a train. The angels have but to move their will, and they're in another place. Um, so there is no, you know, transgressing space and time. It's just a matter of, of, of an act of their will, and they can be transformed from one place to another place. I'll read again another quote. His motion consists in transferring his attention and activity from one object to another without having to pass successively through the, the intermediate places and space. So that's a little clearer than what I just explained. It's transferring the attention and their activity, so their power, to a different object. So again, they act on objects and not necessarily the particular place. How are we doing? I have a question. Okay. Regarding angel prayer, like regard to willing to God. Mm hmm I'm getting ahead of myself. Yeah. Yeah. You probably are. Yeah. Uh, but ask your question. But I have a question. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to say, I'm going to ask you about that. Mm hmm Like, what would you say to the angel prayer? Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about guarding angels later on. Um, <laughs> But no, and two, what I want you all to do, if you have questions that may not pertain to this particular session, write them down, please. And I'd like to collect them so that hopefully I can make sure to address them. You'll be inundated. Just, that's, that's okay. Well, I mean, the, the, the topic itself is not necessarily an easy one. And so, uh, any further questions? That, that's what I have right now on the nature of angels. Okay, we talk about... The, the angelic intellect and the angelic will based on the fact that they're immaterial spiritual beings. The way that they come to know things is an immediate and perfect understanding that was infused at the moment of their creation. Yes, Laura? This is a good question. <laughs> well, based off of what we just said. Yeah, your guardian angel would be with you. But based off of this, it's not like they're always walking side by side. You know, that's, that's you know, I mean, we may visualize it like that. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, but, but again, what we talk about angels in place, they're in a place insofar as they're exerting their power on an object that is in the place. And so you, our angels, the guardian angels, we'll, we'll talk about that again later on, but if they've been assigned to us, 
It means they've been assigned to us to exert their power, not in a domineering type way, but to help, um, so that they would be with us. Yes. <laughs> now you're getting ahead of yourself there. Sorry. It's okay. It's okay. Any further questions? Need for clarification? Because like I said, this stuff is kind of dense. Um, and it's, it's very philosophical. Um, it wasn't my intention to bore you. Um, but again, so, some of these principles are very foundational to, to, the, to understanding the... the yeah. Well, s some of the powers we'll talk about in what you see in Scripture, you know, so the idea that, that they can move physical objects, one, you know, we see that in, um, yeah, their power to fight against evil, the angelic spirits, their power to, um, to help illuminate our intellects and uh, to help move our wills, give us, you know, they're, they're kind of... Uh, Mediators of grace, as you will. You said at the beginning that the angels were created for a purpose. Mm -hmm. And each one, are there angels still being created? Or is there a set number of angels created at the same time? <laughs> yeah, that, that's next class. I, I would love, I'd, I'd love to answer that. But, then <laughs> but anyway, they, you said that, so in other words, Right. And so, you know, if their purpose is to be amongst you or around you at that time, and then they're around because that's the purpose of that moment. Certainly. I mean, they're, they're for the, the holy angels at least, right. you know, um, who have chosen their, their wills will be conformed with the will of God. And so, given what their specific mission is, what is God's will for them, then yes, they would be, be fulfilling that. And if that means... Okay. Did everybody hear that question? They didn't hear that question. So he was, say it again, you were asking about the purpose of the angels. Yeah, I said that, that they were created, each, you said at the beginning that the angels were created for a purpose. Each one came into existence for an exact purpose. Is that right? Yeah. And so, I guess there's different levels of angels that have different purposes to serve God. Certainly, yeah. And so, when she was asking whether or not if the angels are around us all the time and if they're walking with us, they might be because their purpose happens to be where you're at at that moment or what's going on in your life or what's going on in, around you, but not because they're just floating around. Right, yeah, there, there, it's, nothing's accidental when it comes to the angels being in a place. It all has to do with, with fulfilling God's will for them. Um, and so if our guardian angels are near us, so to speak, if they're, they're acting upon us, all the time, it's because they were created with that specific purpose. But he also asked if there were angels being created. He did, and I said that that is to be dealt with next. <laughs> Monica. What about the fallen angels? Mm, the fallen angels. We're going to talk about those later, too. <laughs> we're just trying to establish some foundational principles on what angelic nature is. I didn't say that they have, they, have, they have knowledge of every cause and effect in the sense of they know all the future events. But in a particular moment, right, because of their knowledge of cause and effect relationships, they can tell what's about to happen. Does that make sense? So it's not that they can look like five centuries into the future based off of what's happening now and say this is going to happen. So there's a finite, there's a finite limitation to that. They're still, yeah, they're still finite. They're creatures. Same as ours. Right. Because they're above us. <laughs> and, and some of the knowledge, too, of the holy angels um, would be like, like God's divine prerogative. You know, he, he could give a guardian angel knowledge of, of the person that he's guarding for that person's good if he chose to. But it's, again, that would be more along 
uh, the line of God's grace acting. It's a gift of God as opposed to just their foundational, their nature, without the help of grace. In the back. <laughs> well, we will talk about it a little bit in the last. <laughs> in the last. <laughs> I think, you know, these are, this is my conjecture. I believe that these are the seraphim, which are the highest order yes. of angels. They surround God's throne, and the vision of God's throne is so intense they have to actually shield their face from it, and that's right. why they're. Did y'all hear the question she was asking? Why, if we were going to talk about why the angel in the picture knows judo. And so uh, she was explaining the, art, the artistic expression of Dom Gregory DeWitt. So. Okay. It's, it's, well, it's an interesting topic. I've seen others write on that, that particular passage. Um, so I'm not going to say I, I'm, I'm going to answer your question thoroughly enough to, to please. Um, but but the, she's referring to a section in Genesis where it talks about the sons of God, I believe, were essentially enamored with, with women. And uh, the daughters of men. Yeah, okay. And uh, so that one interpretation of that is that it was angels who came down and procreated with women. Um, again, that would, I mean, I don't know the possibility of that, but according to, to human nature, I mean, it, it, it takes, that's a corporeal act, right? So it's, it, it needs a body. And if angels are incorporeal, um, then that would, you know, again, I, and the, my answer is not necessarily the definitive teaching on the interpretation of the scripture, but I'm saying that's how I would understand it, that, that I would look for another way to interpret the, um, the term sons of God um, to see what that means. Oh, that made me think of something else I was going to say that I think I forgot to say earlier. Mm, maybe it'll come back to me. Yes. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that when we talk about the guardian angels. But just like we said in general, if the, if the angels don't have knowledge of our hearts, if they can't read our minds, then it follows logically that like, for them to know us, if we're going to have a relationship with them, that we would need to communicate with them on some level. She was asking if our guardian angels know when we speak to them. What was your answer? Yeah. My, oh gosh, I'm not speaking. <laughs> my, my answer was that, that if, you know, the, the church tells us that, the, that angels have no knowledge of our, of our hearts, they can't read our minds, then it would logically follow for us to have a relationship with our guardian angel or with any angel, um, then we would have to in some way communicate with them. So, yeah. We uh, have to thank God and angels for all the protection mm -hmm. that they give us daily. Certainly, certainly. Just this morning we were protected. Praise God for that. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I don't know what we're doing on time. Well, that's 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 it in a nutshell, right there. That's the. You like said I, because it was so dense, I didn't want to go too long with you, and leave room for questions. Um, so that's going to be it then. Our first session is complete. And again, if if anything, if you have other questions that you want to write down, please do. That will come next week in the little booklets. What, what we're going to have in that is uh, John Paul II did, he's done six different Wednesday audiences on the angels. And so we're going to print those out for you so you can have something. And then once we get into scripture, you'll be able to follow with that. Too. All right. What do you think about the Peter Craft book on angels and angels? I think that's a very good book. Yeah. Yeah, I've got it. It's very, uh, it's very accessible, I've found. Which book? Peter Kreft. He's got a book on angels and demons. And again, this will be coming in the bibliography um, that we'll get you next week. But it's, it's, a, uh, it's laid out in question and answer format. It's got a lot of questions that he received from students over the years on angels and on demons. And so, yes, it's a good book. Right, they, they don't. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's right. Oh, I'm, I apologize. I apologize. Yeah, okay, so we'll, and again, we're. No, no, it's okay. It's okay, because like I said, I mean, I forget things, but um, it's. We're going to dive right back into to something real difficult again here. So they were, the angels being created are not eternal. Eternity is something proper to God alone. Um, but because they're not material, they don't have bodies, they're not confined to time as well. So they're not eternal on one hand, they're not in time on the other hand. Um, and so, the, the concept is, is a difficult one. They're not, it's important to establish the fact that they're not confined to space and time. Um, that they're immortal, All right? So they they were created, but they will never die. Um, and there's some theologians of they, especially in the Middle Ages around St. Thomas in that time, they would talk about, they would try to to ascribe some type of term to to how they exist. Then you know what is what is this dimension, if you will? And they would call it eternity, I believe. Um, I'm not an expert on Ave Eternity, though, so I, I can't go any further than that, other than saying that, that, that they're, they're not eternal, but at the same time, they're not confined by time. Because time is something that, that is applicable to the material world. Be more, a measure of change <coughs> acting on matter. Robert. Angels and demons created at the same time with the same powers, and then yeah. So he asked if will they if angels and demons were created at the same time. We'll we'll talk about that a little bit next class. But yeah, they're all the same nature, and so all the angels created together. Demons just another term for fallen angel. Okay. All right. Well, thank you all for coming. Thank you for your questions for challenging me.